So welcome to the last talk of Lorenzo. Finish it. Okay, so <coughs> thank you, Axel. Um, so we actually um, what we what we do today is to, to finish our discussion concerning uh, multi-fidelity models for uncertain identification. And uh, in particular, we're going to discuss uh, the, the, the construction of uh, hierarchical, uh, hierarchical models. And then we're going to uh, come back to, the, let's say, the um, deterministic setting, the stochastic developing setting, and we will see uh, how to uh, at least uh, try to solve some of the, of the, of the drawbacks of the, 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 the kind of approach. Um, so, uh, what we, the idea is, what the general idea is, we are introducing yesterday, I'm going to just record it to you quickly. We have our model that we refer to as the high fidelity model, in our case it would make things to the, the full Boltzmann equation. And we want to estimate, uh, to perform some sensitivity analysis with respect to some, to some parameter. And, uh, <coughs> of course, as a model, in general, it's the most accurate one because it represents the, the, the reality for us. And, uh, the, the, but of course, the cost is, uh, is, is, is higher. So we may think about having some uh, surrogate models, which we will use in a control variate setting in order to speed up, essentially, the Monte Carlo, the Monte Carlo simulation of, uh, of the, 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 the in the space of uh, parameters. And we have seen essentially uh, already some examples. What we typically apply in this case is a combination of the uh, BGK type models and uh, so, which means uh, relaxation type models and uh, fluid dynamic models. Okay, so uh, let's, this part we have seen it yesterday, so that's where we, we uh, arrived. So now the idea, we do something different compared to what we have done at the end of the uh, lecture of yesterday, is that we now consider <coughs> a hierarchy of control variates where they have different level of fidelity. Okay? So just if you want to fix your ideas, uh, we have that the full model is the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so you may imagine to have, a, to have a hierarchy just of two models, so L equal 2. You have, may have that F1 is the solution of the Euler system, F2 is the solution of the BGK model. Okay? But in general, you imagine that you have some hierarchy. So now, the idea is, the starting point is actually, in order to compute the expectation of our solution, uh, what we do essentially, and uh, we, we use ML samples actually for the, for, the, for, the, for the full model. Then what we do, we use uh, the, 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 the model with the highest level of fidelity among the surrogates as control value. So what you see here is exactly the, set, the, the starting point of my lecture in general on uh, the use of control variance. So estimate for F computed by a Monte Carlo estimate and then you use, as a control variate, the fidelity model of order L, which has the advantage, as usual, what we say is that its expectation can be, can be computed in a much cheaper way. And then what we did was to optimize this parameter here. Okay? Now, what's the point? Well, if we imagine that this fidelity, if, if, if you start from this setting, then in an abstract form, there's no reason why you shouldn't apply the same algorithm for the estimation of the expectation of f, even to the expectation of your control variable. So, since you have to compute this guy, we have seen that in a time-dependent setting we have to pay a price, because in any case we have to solve the time-dependent uh, uh, solution for the Euler or for the, for the BGK, so why don't apply this in a recursive way? So, what we do then is, in order to estimate the expectation of our first control variate, we, we use a different set of samples that we call it ML minus 1, which is much larger than the original set of samples because the idea is that as soon as we move from uh, here from right to left, the, the computation becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and so we can afford a higher number of statistical samples, statistical run. And 
Then what we do, we use uh, the Monte Carlo estimate on this and as control variate, as it is natural, we use the second model in the hierarchy, that, because these have a, a precise hierarchical order, in order to reduce, essentially, to accelerate the Monte Carlo estimate. That's how it reads. So now, the, the thing is completely clear, no? Now we play this game in a recursive way in order to estimate fl minus the expectation of fl minus 1, we are going to use fl minus 2 as control variable. We go all the way down and we stop with the final estimate where, of course, when we reach the, the, the model with the lowest level of fidelity, then there is nothing more that we can use as control variable. So for that model, we are going to just compute the Monte Carlo estimate of its expectation. Of course, since this one is the cheaper, the number of samples that I'm using is the larger. Okay, so in this way, what we just by construction, we have this hierarchy of control variants and this uh, hierarchy of uh, samples which are essentially ordered in this way all along the, the thing. So here you, you may ask yourself why are you using a hat over this lambda here? You will understand this in the, in the next slide. Okay, so uh, what because what I will do now is to combine all this recursive estimate in one single estimate. So basically what I will do, I replace this thing here by this expression, then I replace this thing here by the other expression, then this one here by this estimate, and so on. So you get a nested product at a certain point of control variance. That's how it reads. So I'm going to call this estimator exactly with the same notation as before. The only thing is that now it's, it's going to depend on a vector of, uh, uh, of parameters, so lambda 1 hat, lambda l hat, that I, 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 I store in a capital, I summarize in a capital lambda hat. And that's essentially the nested structure that you get. So if we now introduce the value lambda without the hat, which are given by the partial product of the lambda hat, then we can recast the estimator in this form here or in the equivalent form that you see written down here. So if already if you have some familiarity with multi-level Monte Carlo, you recognize that the situation is, looks uh, rather similar. Of course, this is a multi-fidelity setting. So we, we haven't specified anything about uh, the, the, where the control variance came from. It's absolutely general what we are doing. And this is actually our estimator that we get. In order to write it in this form, so to have a compact notation, I have introduced, you see that here uh, we, we have a lambda L plus 1 and the FL plus 1. We, for lambda L plus 1 is simply 1 and FL plus 1 is our full model. Okay? So, which is embedded into here to have a compact, compact notation. So that's our estimator. So we know what we, the, the game we played yesterday, it's our original uh, game, which is now try, of course, th this looks a little bit more complicated, try to compute the variance and to minimize it in order to compute the optimal values for this quantity here. Well, you can do this thing even here. It's just slightly more complicated, but not much. You, what you do, you compute the, the, the total variance of your estimator, which, again, what we do in order to, to compute this expression is we use the central limit theorem and we assume that all samples are statistically independent. Okay? By the independence of the samples, this is the expression in general you get. Then what you do, you, this is a multidimensional uh, function in the space of the, 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 the essential the, 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 the parameter which uh, uh, modulate the effect of the control variant. So we can do a direct differentiation as, actually, as, as we did yesterday. The main difference is that yesterday we originate a full system. Now here we get a three diagonal system in this case, which is satisfied by our optimal set of parameters. Uh, one of the problems with this system is that, in general, well, it depends on the situation you have, because it depends how the, 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 the various models are correlated. Uh, in general, the, the, of course, solving a three-diagonal system is not, uh, is, is not an issue. 
but if you are in a, in a setting like we were yesterday, where the, the control variates uh, refers to model which have a strong difference in terms of computational cost, then even the amount of samples that you are using for the various model is definitely very different. So the amount of samples we can afford to solve Euler is of an order of magnitude larger than the amount of samples we can use in order to solve the BGK model, which is by several order of magnitudes larger than the amount of samples we can use to solve the Bachmann equation, okay? Which means that in our case, the, 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 the difference between the number of samples for the level H and the number of samples of the level H minus one is very strong. If this, if, if this is true, it's quite easy to show that this system essentially diagonalizes, it becomes just a diagonal, and uh, up to, of course, uh, this, uh, the, the, the difference of this uh, quantity. And we can just write down explicitly the, the solution, which we call the quasi-optimal solution, which are simply given, you see here, you, you recognize here that this is the optimal value of the lambda parameter when essentially we compute the expectation of the level j plus 1 by using f as control variant fj. So it's essentially, if you just optimize this thing locally, okay, you get exactly that, that, that result. So this tells you that if the, the fidelity models are well separated, let's use this terminology, then essentially by optimizing each level independently from the other, you get essentially already the optimal solution. Of course, this is different if the fidelity models are not so well separated, as we will see. I'll show you some examples. Uh, uh, well, a, a prominent one, actually. Uh, in that case, uh, you, you have to go through the solution of this three-diagonal system in order to get your optimal set of parameters. Okay? So, good. Uh, we can uh, uh, perform an estimate which, is, uh, which follows more or less the line of what we are seeing yesterday concerning, concerning the, the, the error bound. And uh, in, uh, if we still are in a space homogeneous setting, as we, 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 we just did yesterday to keep notation uh, simpler, uh, then uh, you have this kind of estimate where you recognize essentially that you have the deterministic source of error and then the various source of error which are due essentially to the, the various, uh, to the various level which you, which you uh, include. Now, the, the, the crucial point here is to observe that if there is enough correlation, then essentially this quantity is uh, uh, smaller than uh, the quantity you have here. So remember that M0 is the finest grid of samples, so which is the, the, the essentially the best thing we can obtain from the viewpoint of the statistical estimate. So, sorry, what is C here? So C is the, the product over there, but ta tau? Tau is here. Ah, okay. Okay. So, but uh, you, you will see uh, there's an easy way to see essentially uh, that uh, how it works in one, at least in one setting. Imagine me, you consider the case where I'm writing here epsilon to zero, but you have to think here as time t goes to infinity, okay? This uh, we, we have seen yesterday that the two things in terms of reducing statistical fluctuation are the same if you consider the homogeneous and the space non homogeneous setting. So, uh, in a, in a, uh, then uh, that basically, if all control variants have share the property that they converge to the same steady state, okay, then what happens? Well, clearly, all the correlation coefficient asymptotically goes to one. We say that all this sigma here goes to zero, okay. So this term disappears, and you get only the fine grid solution, which is the best you can have because. You, you need to have some statistical estimate at the end. Okay? So we have exactly the same advantages that we have seen uh, yesterday. But the idea is that what we, what we aim. Remember that the game you play here with Monte Carlo is not the game as you, the, the standard game you play with deterministic method where you say, well, I'm trying to achieve a higher order of accuracy. No, that's not the point. In Monte Carlo, you have to, to, to reduce, so to, to reduce the error for a given computational cost, okay? Typically, it's the computational cost, the thing that measures 
the way your method works. Because we know that you have, in any case, we are essentially uh, um, vinculated by the central limit theorem in terms of statistical coverage. So, uh, and uh, this is, for example, the, the, this, the, just to, to show you what happens, this is the um, problem we, we, with, uh, the, with uh, we call it the sudden heating, so the case where we have an uncertain boundary condition, and I'm using this hierarchical approach just with two levels, so basically what I'm doing is I solve the Boltzmann equation for a certain number of samples, okay? I solve the VGK with for a larger number of samples, and then I solve Euler for an even larger number of samples. Then I use the VGK in order to reduce the fluctuations in the Boltzmann solution, but in order to apply the VGK to the Boltzmann solution, I need to compute the estimate of the VGK, so to compute the estimate of the VGK, I use Euler as a control variable for the VGK, okay? So computationally, it becomes something, okay? Because if you think that the, 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 the full model is already the full Boltzmann equation, I'm not playing with the toy model here. But the, the advantage you can you can see here immediately uh, that that we get compared to just for a given computational cost the use of a single control variable with a BGK model. So if we fix the computational cost, this is the Monte Carlo error that we get. Here is a 10 to the minus two, the Nielsen number, and 10 to the minus three on the right. Now, this is the Monte Carlo solution, and what you see here is the, the application of just the one control variable based on VGK. So you see that just by introducing Euler, which has a negligible computational cost essentially in, uh, in the situation of in, in, our, in, our, in our setting, uh, this, for a certain computational cost, what is able Euler to do? Is able to improve the BGK estimate, the statistical estimate of the BGK. So basically, the expectation, okay? And you see that we are able, of course, to gain something in this setting and to gain almost one digit of precision in the, the other setting. But the core point is that the computational cost is the same of the procedure, okay? So, very good. Uh, of course, if as I told you, if you have some, some familiarity with multi-level Monte Carlo, you, you, have, you should have recognized that this setting embeds the classical multi-level Monte Carlo. In multi-level Monte Carlo, the idea is the following. There is no reason why you shouldn't just use a numerical method as a source of control variable. So basically, what you do as control variable, you, you consider a hierarchy of discretization. So, of course, if you change your discretization parameter, for example, you take a finer mesh in general for a given model, then the computational cost will increase and you expect that your method to be more accurate, okay? So you can just build up a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, discretization where the finest grid corresponds to your high fidelity model and the <coughs> essentially the coarsest grid will correspond to the, the model with a lower level of fidelity, okay? Then, for example, the, this is a, a, if we imagine to consider the space homogeneous setting, you take, we define by delta V1 the coarsest resolution, and then we refine the grid by increasing the level of n just by dividing it, uh, it every time by a factor of 2. This is just a simple example. Now, if you do this, then you can apply absolutely the, the, the previous setting, but in particular, if we, after doing that, we fix all the control parameters to be equal to 1, then we get, as an expression, exactly the so-called multi-level Monte Carlo estimator. Okay? So, uh, of course, there's an add-on feature here that you may think about, so why taking lambda equal to 1 here? Okay? The reason why you take lambda equal to 1, typically in the original version, is that it is somehow cheaper and in many situations, especially if you deal with smooth solution, completely smooth solution, the, the, the lambda that you compute are, are essentially one. That's the point. Uh, but this may not be the case, especially for hyperbolic problems, so when you have shocks, which is a, a common feature of our, uh, let's say, of our business. And so the use of these quasi-optimal values or the optimal values for the lambda will originate a quasi-optimal or optimal version of multi-level Monte Carlo in this case. Um, and uh, here is, for example, uh, this is a, a result which is a, 
uh, taken from a, a, a working process in progress to, together with the, with the Jing Wei, where we are actually applying this uh, technique to uh, the BGK, a BGK model with, with uncertainty. So this is a shot, uh, shot tube, so it's a shock tube problem. Uh, this you see, uh, that these are just the expectation of the density. <coughs> Uh, here we are in the in the in the in the fluid limit. You see some smoothness here, some regularity, which is due to the fact that the expectation is going to average in the in the random space. Uh, so the, the the what we have uh, we are computing the multi standard multi level, uh, quasi uh, optimal multi level, and the optimal multi level Monte Carlo. But here we take a, if you take a look at the error. You observe that more or less exactly in correspondence to the position where you have uh, originally shocks, what you get is that by the, the error in the multi-level Monte Carlo, it uses this blue curve here, uh, it's uh, improved by the use of the quasi-optimal and the optimal here. You see there's not a lot of difference actually, we, we, you may say that uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, and this is something which has been confirmed by uh, other simulation. We even even in this setting, we observe some improvement when we switch from multi-level to multi standard to the quasi uh, optimal setting. And when we pass to the optimal setting, we didn't observe a lot of uh, a lot of in, a lot of improvement. Uh, even because the computation of this optimal uh, is a, is a, an optimal parameter it, it involves the solution. Of a highly hill post problem, so it's already it's already difficult in itself. Okay, but nevertheless you can improve it, and the reason why you improve it exactly in this point is that in those situations when you have a discontinuous solution, when you pass from one grid to another, the difference between the, the level is higher compared to a smooth solution, and in that case it's optimizing the parameter which combines the two may be relevant. Okay, so this was my last uh, slide in the, let's say, in the Monte Carlo, in the Monte Carlo world. Now we go back and we talk a little bit about stochastic Galerkin method uh, by trying to see how we can develop methods, some ideas on how to develop this method in such a way that, that we preserve some of the structure that we have in our program. Oh, yes. So if you go back to the previous. Yes. So here you mentioned M naught, right? Yes. In the slide, two slides before. Yes. Uh, what was the M naught there? Uh, the yes. SPO. Yes. Yes. Uh, the next one. This one. Fifty one. Is the number of samples that you use for the 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 the, the courses to yeah. So in the slide fifty one, you showed another example. Yeah. Here. Yes. What was the M naught here for the higher? Uh, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so here <laughs> the only point is that this is M0. So that okay, there's just a shift of the indices. Okay, so we are using 10 to the 4 for Euler, 10 to the square for BGK, and just 10 for both. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so st uh, <coughs> stochastic Galerkin method, this is just, this slide just to recall things that we have already seen in the first uh, lecture, but uh, I'm writing this down uh, in a specific case of a kinetic equation, so by using <coughs> consistent notations. So just to fix the idea, let's consider again a space homogeneous setting so that we have an additional dependent just on the velocity, and we have the generalized polynomial chaos expansion, which is the expansion with respect to stochastic orthogonal polynomial for f that is written down here where the, this Pm are our set of orthogonal polynomials of degree less than m, which we assume to be orthonormal with respect to our uh, probability density function of the random of the random variable. Again, we are assuming here a one-dimensional setting for the random space, as it is usually done in, in our case for, for uh, stochastic Galerkin method. Okay? And the, all these have hat are simply the projection of our solution with respect to the, the polynomial base. Okay, that's exactly the same. Nothing, nothing new. So now, uh, as we discuss uh, uh, stochastic Galerkin method, they are pretty interesting because if the solution is smooth, they can achieve spectral accuracy, uh, smooth in the random space. Uh, um, but they present some drawbacks uh, when we apply to kinetic equation or in general to equation <coughs> which have some structure. So typically. 
uh, they, they, they lead to the loss of the main physical properties like uh, positivity, uh, conservation of moments, which uh, in our case are essential to characterize the long time behavior of the system and in particular the local Maxwellian equilibrium. Well, of course, this is a, a pretty well-known uh, problem uh, in, in, if you deal with spectral methods in general because it's completely clear that uh, typically when you, when you expand your, your solution in terms of some uh, orthogonal polynomial, positivity is the first thing you, you uh, actually, actually you lose, but then, okay, you say I'm losing it just uh, in a spectral sense, so the, the error I commit is just spectrally, spectrally small, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you, you, you have the same kind of error on, uh, on the moments, and these uh, actually, even if you can show that if your solution is smooth, there's approximated with spectral accuracy, in the long time, accumulation of this error are going to drive your system towards essentially the wrong, the wrong equilibrium, the wrong equilibrium state. So basically here, what's written is that what I mean by, by that you lose conservation of moment is, is that if you have your set of moments here, then you typically, if you compute your moment uh, in, in, instead of with respect to your solution to the, your, your uh, stochastic Galerkin expansion, uh, then these two things are of course different because the two functions are different and the way you compute them are different. Uh, so one possibility is to try to modify the coefficient in our, your expansion or to modify the polynomial basis in such a way that the macroscopic moments or f or the positivity are preserved. The, you, you, actually, there are ways to do these kind of things. There are uh, uh, some approach which has been designed classically for spectral method but uh, uh, um, to my knowledge, uh, there, there, is, there is no, uh, I've never seen any method which keeps spectral accuracy. So basically, the, the best you can do typically is to preserve some accuracy, like second order in some cases or things like that. Uh, but typically, then you, 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 the, the spectral accuracy is lost by the procedure where you enforce somehow the constraint that, that of, the, of the conservation of, of, of the moment. So uh, there's another point that I will not discuss, but just for, uh, in order to, be, uh, uh, to, to give a complete picture of the situation, we have to be careful with stochastic Galerkin method because it's, it is well known that for nonlinear hyperbolic conservation laws, and uh, it's not the case of the Boltzmann equation, but it's the case of the Euler, Euler system, so it's the fluid limit of the Boltzmann equation, uh, when we apply this generalized polynomial chaos expansion, we typically have a loss of hyperbolicity of the resulting approximated system. So we just apply the expansion because of the truncation, you get some uh, system which should be hyperbolic, but because of the truncation, you get uh, a, a, a complex eigenvalues in the, in, the, in, the, in the system, and this may produce uh, the, the wrong essentially uh, Propagation of shocks, sub shocks, and the usual things. Okay, but I will not deal with this. I will try to, to deal a little bit with this issue of the structural properties to try to see how we can uh, try to cure this 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 this, this approach. Um, so one idea is to design uh, a, a set of equilibrium preserving stochastic Galerkin method. And uh, this idea is uh, fully borrowed, actually, from uh, the, the, the experience we have with uh, spectral method in the phase space for the Boltzmann equation. So, uh, let me formalize it. Uh, you start with the space homogeneous Boltzmann equation, here, and uh, then you apply your standard stochastic Galerkin method. So, your standard stochastic Galerkin method can be written in the space of the coefficient as follows, where I introduce this vector here, and this uh, q hat h term is exactly defined as follows. This is exactly the projection, and you know, you remember what we have to do essentially. We, what we do, we plug here, uh, instead of f, the, 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 the stochastic expansion, and then we project the equation back to the space of uh, orthogonal polynomials. And that's exactly what you get. This is the projection, in, in, which in our case is the the, 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 the expectation uh, in, the, in, the, in the random space. Now, if we now use this decomposition, so basically we know that 
we know the equilibrium state for this uh, function f, and then we use what is usually referred to as micro-macro decomposition. We already use it even in the Monte Carlo setting, if you remember, as a simple example of control variate. But now using this with a different spirit, I just apply this decomposition and uh, I rewrite this homogeneous Boltzmann equation with respect to the perturbation G. Now what I'm going to use is the bilinearity of Q and the fact that Q evaluated at the steady state is equal to zero and if you have this representation of your uh, collision, collision operator, the linear operator in general, where your L is a linear operator which is defined as the two, let's say, the symmetric interaction between G and the equilibrium state. Okay? I'm using typically a bilinear setting because it's very common in kinetic theory. Of course, you have also linear kinetic equations, but then things are even easier. Okay? So this is the, let's say, the, 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 the kind of mm, uh, setting which typically is, is interesting. Now, now why, the, why this expansion is interesting for <coughs> us? Because now the idea is to apply the stochastic Galerkin projection to the perturbation, which uh, the, the equation satisfied by the perturbation, which is written down here. Of course, uh, because the perturbation is the difference between F and its equilibrium, the steady state of the perturbation now is zero. And the nice thing is that zero lives in our space of orthogonal polynomial. Whereas, in general, our equilibrium state doesn't live in the space of orthogonal polynomial. That's the point. So, which means that it can be represented exactly. But even if you don't think of this in this form, it's very easy just to follow the, the computation. This is the transformer problem. Now, we just write down, so we just apply stochastic Galerkin to this problem here. And that's the a kind of approximation you get. You get exactly the same coefficient, the same expansion Q had before, but now evaluated with respect to the vector G, uh, plus this term here, which is defined as follows. Uh, now, you can just, by, by direct uh, substitution, you observe that if you set all G hat of H equal to zero, that would correspond to the expansion of the, of our, our uh, equilibrium state in the, the space of orthogonal polynomial, then these are local equilibrium because this will vanish and also these will vanish and so they will not change. So if you initially set all this g hat of h equals zero, then these are maintained for all time, which means that these are a, an admissible local equilibrium of the system. So that if if you from this representation, this tells you that when g hat of h is equal to zero, then the modes of f hat of h are exactly equal to the modes of its equilibrium state, and then we have a nice equilibrium preserving representation expansion. So that's the way it works, but it may be interesting to observe, to revert the, the, the things back to the original variable. So what we do? Now, what we can do is just to substitute g hat of h with uh, f hat of h minus f hat infinity of h. If you do this and you perform some little algebra, you realize that with respect to the original coefficient of my uh, probability density function, the stochastic the quadratic scheme, the equilibrium preserving inversion, can be rewritten as follows. And from here, you clearly observe that whenever f hat is equal to f hat of infinity, these two things now are going to cancel, and then you get zero, and the steady state is preserved. Uh, you can rewrite this even in terms of the original expansion. So we go back now, we, 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 we move to the to, from the space of, of the coefficient to the physical space. And this is the way the equilibrium preserving method reads. So you have the derivative of your expansion, which is again is equal to the difference between the, the, the approximated uh, uh, interaction operator and with respect to the uh, polynomial basis evaluated with respect to your function expanded in the polynomial basis, minus the same thing with respect to the expansion of your steady state with respect to our orthogonal polynomial basis. And that's it. Now, what about the accuracy of this approach? The point is that if we have a spectral estimate which exactly 
this uh, two the, 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 which uh, mimics the, the, the situation that we have uh, essentially done together with uh, Francis Pilbet and Thomas Ray in, uh, uh, for the classical spectral method in, in velocity. So if we have a spectral estimate for our interaction operator of this type, and this is the spectral estimate which tells you that the classical stochastic Galerkin method converts with spectral accuracy, uh, so for a, a function f, which, has, uh, which, which is in, uh, in the subtle space hr, this is exactly the same thing we have seen uh, initially. If you have this kind of estimate, so spectral convergence, then your equilibrium state uh, 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 typically is a smooth function, so we must assume that if we want to have a spectral accuracy that the equilibrium state is in, uh, in, uh, in the subtle space. This is the case, for example, for the, for the classical Maxwellian, but it may be the case for other equilibrium state, then of course if the equilibrium state has not some smoothness property, there's no way we, we can imagine to, to have a, a accuracy above a certain threshold. Now because this is equal to zero, so just plug this into this estimate, this vanish, then you get the estimate of this at the equilibrium state, and then you just by replacement, you have that this quantity here is spectrally small. So, it's a, it's a spectral approximation of zero. In the physical space, this is zero. In our space of uh, uh, generalized polynomial chaos, this is not zero, but it's spectrally small. And what we're doing here is simply removing the spectrally small error, which is removed instantaneously in time from the computation of Q. That's the reason why the method preserved the steady state. And if you look at the, uh, what happens in practice, for example, is the following. Here, we are, we are, we are just uh, applying this thing for a Fokker-Planck equation. So typically what happens is that at a certain point, the method saturates the error. This is time, okay? This is the classical uh, GPC method. So at a certain point, after a while, the method saturates its error and uh, it goes uh, essentially to the error provided by the kind of discretization we are using. Uh, actually, if you really wait for a longer time, then you, you, you will also observe that this thing is going to even, uh, even, even increase. Uh, whereas uh, for the, the, uh, the equilibrium preserving G generalized polynomial chaos or stoch new stochastic Galerkin method, what happens is that not only the error goes down up to machine precision <coughs> because of the, uh, the space of parameter, but actually as a side effect, you have it, that it also goes down in, in all the other spaces, uh, 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 also in the physical space, because typically since this thing here is known, okay, so then there's no need to approximate it over a grid, so you can imagine that you know it in all, at all points, and so when you do the expansion, you just compute the expansion locally over the grid without doing any any discretization. And this gives you essentially exactly the, the, the difference. That's the classical difference between, a, let's say, a method which preserves the steady state and a method that doesn't preserve the steady state. This idea is very general. It requires the knowledge of the equilibrium state, but it's quite interesting the fact that it can be applied also in situations where the equilibrium state is not known, just by using some approximation of the equilibrium state or approximation of problem which converge toward the right equilibrium state, okay? Because, of course, this thing becomes relevant when we uh, essentially uh, are close to the equilibrium state. Okay? <coughs> Otherwise, this is like a, a spectrally small quantity which is even not seen by, 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 the, by, by the simulation. How do you consider the equilibrium uh, since it's uh, stochastic? How can you take this action in the end of Yeah, yeah, but the equilibrium the, the depends just on the, on the, 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 um, uh, on the, on the moment of the distribution, okay? Uh, this, this is going to depend on, uh, the, so it depends on the stochastic term yeah. from the moment of the distribution. And then you perform an expansion, the, this, this uh, expansion here. Okay. This one here, over your equilibrium state, okay? So you think at the stochastic, at the set of, you, can, you may think, as, the, 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 as, as I say, uh, the, to the, the, this, mm, your, your stochastic variable really as a deterministic variable at the end of the day. Okay. But one of the 
one needs to show that the smoothness in the probability space. So that's another job. So, so that the smooth thing and the smoothness from the initial data is transferred into yeah, that, that for sure. So if you, you're you're thinking that this is what I'm just showing here are just consistently estimated. They are completely general. So if you have a specific problem and you want to prove spectral convergence, for example, uh, not spectral consistency, which is the kind of things uh, uh, being general I just introduced, then it, it's problem dependent. And uh, there's a plenty uh, among the, 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 the list of reference that I've shown you yesterday, uh, which are mostly related to the research group of Xi Jinping. You, you have a, a lot of results exiting that direction on the propagation, essentially, um, of regularity in the, in the, in the random space. Okay. But the, the nice thing is that you can just combine the two. Once you have that, then you have that, and you combine the two, and you get the, the, the result. So, uh, in the last 15, 20 minutes... So what is steady state measuring yeah. method for the Boltzmann? So if you don't use this trick, we know that after a long time, uh, the only uh, steady state you will, you will observe is just one, right? Because one is in your uh, yeah. approximation space. Yeah. So if you use this trick, then what in a long time, so for a long time simulation, and what is the steady state you will obtain? You, uh, the, the optimal thing you can obtain. So you, what, you, what you get as a steady state is exactly your representation of the real steady state in your uh, uh, space of orthogonal polynomial. So the projection in the case of the full bulk band is you, you take your Gaussian, okay, you compute the GPC for the Gaussian, that's exactly what you obtain. Okay, so uh, particle stochastic Galerkin method. Uh, well, here the idea is, of course, we, we want to somehow try to, to save some of the, of the, of the uh, physical property in a stochastic Galerkin setting, so, which means that basically we, we are assuming to have a solution which is smooth in the random space. Okay? Uh, that's the starting point. Now, the idea is to combine the stochastic Galerkin approach in the random space with particle methods for the approximation of f in the phase space. So the particle methods are rather popular in, in, in kinetic theory. They've been developed for many, many different kinds of kinetic equations. So uh, they, 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 that's essentially the kind of approach we have. So um, most of these methods, basically, they resort on the computation of some from a set of particles. So the, 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 the most, uh, let's say, stochastic particle method are related somehow to the original dynamics of the PD. The main ingredient is the fact that you compute, let's say, the physical dynamic on a set of randomly chosen particles. Okay, that's basically the guideline. But then the specific design depends on the specific partial differential equation you have, the specific kinetic equation you have. So just to fix the idea, I'm going to consider uh, the following vlasov fokker planck problem uh, for, the, for the evolution of F. So it's a non-local problem, which typically you have this term, which describes some alignment, and this term, which describes some diffusion. That's exactly the, 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 the kind of prototype model I've introduced together with the Bachmann equation at the beginning. Okay? Uh, so now, what in this case, the, uh, to associate the particle system to this equation is rather natural because uh, you, you, you can derive the previous blasov fokker planck equation from uh, the, the following system of stochastic differential equation in uh, some uh, mean fi uh, field limit where now each uh, <coughs> particle has depends on your random input in a, a, a not only not only on on time, so uh, that's exactly the, the the setting. So you have the alignment the alignment process process plus some some uh, uh, Brownian noise with with a certain with a certain uh, with a certain uh, variance which is characterized by the diffusion coefficient d. Okay, so uh, actually we, what we the, the, this. The, the, so let's say this system here, you can, you can show that under a suitable assumption, if you define the empirical measure which is associated to the, the, the particle system, 
then under suitable assumption this measure essentially as n goes to infinity is going to converge to your solution of the of the uh, of focal flank uh, of your glass of focal flank problem uh, actually it's enough to it's uh, rather easy to, to go the other way around so you, you just plug essentially this into this term and then you get essentially these kind of things okay so um, the idea is the following now instead of solving the original Lazar Foucault Planck equation, we think about solving the essentially the particle system. Okay? Well, of course, as you, we know what we have to <coughs> what the game we have to play subsequently is the fact that up to here, this is the original microscopic particle system which describes the dynamic, then we have to, to try to embed into this really some game in order to reduce the overall computational cost. Okay? So now what we do, we consider our stochastic galactic approximation of the particle system. Namely, we expand each stochastic particle with respect to this generalized polynomial chaos expansion. So this it's a, just a, a set. It's a set of stochastic uh, uh, differential equation. You do the expansion and then you do the projection and you get the particle stochastic galactic method where you have the evolution, the, the stochastic equation, which now refers to the coefficient in the, the, your stochastic Galerkin approximation. So it mimics exactly the, 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 the application that we have seen, that we have seen uh, before. Remember now that now why we're doing this? Well, we're doing this because we know that since now these are following the physics, the, 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 the pro properties like conservation or uh, positivity, they are just uh, inherited from the physics. So what we have, it, it doesn't matter when you, when you have a, a velocity of a particle that moves, you don't have any positivity, uh, uh, let's say, um, principle to apply. The particle can go everywhere. When you reconstruct your probability density function, it's of course always positive. Okay? That's the point. That's the core point. So here, the physics is fully preserved. So, uh, how we reduce the computational complexity, because in general, as you see here, the computational complexity of this approach is uh, pretty high in general, because what you have, the, the, the complexity of the particle system, if we have n particles, is equal to the square of the number of particles, and since uh, the, the, the method has a, 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 a nonlinearity in the, in, the, in the alignment term, then we have to do also an, a quadratic cost in the space of, uh, of parameters. So then the, the whole computational cost is quadratic with respect to m, so the number of modes that we have taken in the expansion, and with respect to the number of particles, which, usually, which can be pretty large in general. So we can obtain a strong reduction of computational complexity by using a suitable Monte Carlo evaluation of the interaction dynamics that we developed together with, with, with Giacomo Albi uh, some time ago in a general, in, 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 for, for general problems of this, uh, of this type. The idea is the following. Instead of solving the original problem here, where you have the wall cost here, what you do here is just for each particle i, you select a random subset of size s, which is less or equal than n, of your particle indexes, and instead of averaging over the whole set of particles, you average over a subset, which is sampled uniformly at random from your original subset. Okay? So basically, use a Monte Carlo evaluation of a sum. Uh, now, if you do this, of course, then you have a strong reduction of computational cost because, of course, instead of having uh, the n squared, now you have s times n, which is where you, where you may aim at having some reduction. We cannot play any reduction here naturally in the space of parameters uh, because the reason is that we want still to keep the spectral accuracy in the space of parameter in such a way that with few parameters we are able to get good, good results. Even if, so we are highly accurate in the space of parameter and 
poorly accurate because of the Monte Carlo evaluation in the physical space. Okay? Which means that with really very few, very few ex modes in the expansion, we can make the error essentially uniform in the, in the, in the method. So the method works then as follows. This is just a, a, a description of, uh, of uh, how the algorithm works. So basically, let's imagine that we're using the simple Euler method to update the particles. In principle, one can use a, a, a more, accurate, more accurate method. Uh, but this is not a big issue because the, 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 the order delta t error that is going to introduce is probably dominated by the statistical error that is due to the particle simulation. So that's the reason why you focus on simple Euler method in this setting. Then you take n samples from your initial data. So you have a continuous initial data and you have two samples. Okay? And we take n samples which are denoted by xi and vi. And we fix, let's say with s, the, the price we want to pay in the, in the, evaluation, in the evaluation of the sample. Of course, the, 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 the smaller the s, the faster is the method, but in some sense then you lose you lose some, some accuracy. Now you perform your expansion of all particles and uh, so that you switch to the, 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 the let's say, the, 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 the modes for each simple particle. Now you, you <coughs> what you do is, is uh, the following. Okay, so this has to, to be, these two things, are the three and four has to be switched, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what we do now, you do a time loop a loop over all particles. Now you sample for each particle i. You sample the set of particles which will interact with the, with your particles, and then you update your system in the in the in the in the in the modes of the of the particle by using this fast evaluation of the sum. You iterate this, and then at the end you have to reconstruct your quantity of interest accordingly to, let's say, your favorite reconstruction process. But the nice thing is that you have to reconstruct it just from a set of particles. So positions and velocity. So the end, which preserve the, 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 the physical property and the microscopic level, it's at least in statistical sense. So that's the reduction that I've already seen and discussed. So now the, 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 here is the advantage, as I say, you keep the, the typical spectral convergence in the random space, which in this case is not that we are really interested to observe the spectral convergence, what we are just really interested in is the fact that because of that we can use a very small values for m in the, in, the, in the simulation. And we keep all the physics because of course the particle system uh, um, is being just based on particle uh, implies just a reconstruction process of your, of your, of your density. So if, if you consider all particles, then you have the typical convergence rate for the, the, the particle system, which is like n to the minus one half. So you have to balance the spectral error and this error, but then you, you pay the quadratic cost. If you use this fast evaluation, then you can show that you have a, a, an additional error on the top of that, which is given by the square root of one over s minus one, uh, uh, one over n, uh, and with s smaller than n. So if you take s equal n, this error actually, uh, this uh, error uh, <coughs> So, uh, just one uh, last example, and then I'm finishing my, my lecture. Uh, this is, for example, uh, just an alignment process. We have no diffusion. This is the Cooker uh, and Smail model. So, basically, in, in, as time goes to infinity, uh, particles are going to concentrate on a, on, a, on a direct delta. This is particularly challenging, actually, for deterministic methods. So, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a problem where particle methods perform pretty well because they are able to describe very well, of course, the, the direct delta because they don't, do not require any, any kind of smoothness. And this is, of course, uh, for, for uh, an intermediate time, the, the, the convergence of the reconstructed particle dis distribution with the classical generalized polynomial chaos uh, approximation of your solution. Here you see the evolution in time of the distribution, which at time t equal 10 is essentially already a, a delta. Here, what you have on the left, you see the convergence with respect to the parameter s, which is used for the computation of the, the, the essentially of the uh, 
of, of the sum uh, whenever is used to here n is equal to 10 to the 4 so when s is equal to 10 to the 4 we are so we are computing we have the whole the whole uh, uh, quadratic cost but you see that you get very very reasonable error even with a very small value of uh, of uh, of s and uh, here you see essentially the 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 the, the influence, so the number of modes that you really need in order to match the, 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 the error in the statistical space. And you see that here, basically, with two modes, you always, it, uh, they are enough, so just n equal 2, in order to get uh, the same accuracy as you have in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the physical space. So at the end, the method is, uh, is, can be very effective for some, uh, some kind of problem. So, thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Any questions? Maybe also concerning the, the other talks of Lorenzo. So what if we have less conservations in the uh, hierarchy that you presented today? So, so we are, here we have Boltzmann, uh, Euler, and so on, but uh, if we, we have less conservations, you can reconstruct the Maxwellian. Let's say we have less information on the Maxwellian. Uh, the, the speaking in, about so, the okay, are you talking, talking, for example. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the, 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 the say hierarchical control variable for the multi fidelity setting. Uh, I think the, 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 the construction of the surrogate model is really problem dependent. So according to the particular problem you're dealing with, then you can construct your surrogate your surrogate model. Uh, uh, for example, if you are dealing with a I, as a general setting here, I fix the fluid limit of the Boltzmann equation because it's, let's say, it's, a, it's a probably the, the most popular setting and one of also of the most challenging setting for the development of numerical method. But for example, if you consider the diffusion limit, then of course you may imagine to use as surrogate model the, the, the diffusive limit of the equation or some intermediate asymptotic expansion of it or you can even use some dimension reduction of the model. If you consider, let's say, a, a, a socioeconomic setting, let's say, uh, we, as the one discussed by, by in the lecture by, by Toscani, uh, then uh, what, we, what we know is that typically for the bottom equation it's difficult to compute the steady state, but for the corresponding fokker planck model you can compute steady state. So you can use those steady state as surrogate model and uh, and so on, but that's really problem dependent. Any other question? So, in the general setting you mentioned in the very first lecture, so you want the surrogate models to preserve this long time behavior and to preserve yeah. the moments. But uh, the preserving the moments is it very essential, or is it the first moment? You see, or the zero moment? Uh, well, in, in no. Uh, actually, mm, you don't need at all any moment conservation. That was just like a guideline for us to derive uh, to derive the surrogate model. Because uh, if you remember, whatever you put into the game, even you take the solution of the Schrödinger equation and you're solving Boltzmann, then it's okay. The, 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 the optimization process is simply going to tell you that the correlation is very weak, so it's going to compute lambda equals zero, so it's going to completely ignore that, that solution. So the, 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 the real point is to try to find a surrogate model which is cheap and in the random space highly correlated with the, 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 the solution you're trying to compute. Another question, so the high predicted model you are considering is the Boltzmann. Have you tried others like lambda equation? Uh, uh, no, actually, we 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 have we have done things with uh, with Boltman. We are doing things with uh, uh, BGK. We are doing some other works in uh, let's say other Boltman equation in social economy, but we we haven't done anything for for Lanka. But on the other hand, I mean, if you think to the general methodology, it's completely clear. I mean, just. Think to your problem. The point you, you this is based on existing solver. You have just to find a good surrogate for your particular for your particular problem. So, oh, problem for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, if there are no more questions, now let's thank 
Thank you.